Today's video is going to cover differential amplifiers and a differential amp is a device which takes two signals and compares these and then amplifies and outputs the difference between these two points. If the two signals are identical it will suppress the output and we'll get something called the common mode rejection ratio. So in this video we're going to be looking at an example of a differential amp and you can see one here and we'll be testing out the features of the common mode amp including how it will balance the current how we can get an amplified signal out and how we can improve it by adding a constant current source to the input of the device so let's get started what you see here is a simplified example of what a differential amplifier schematic might look like a good differential amplifier will be capable of telling the giving you the difference at the at its outputs of which it has two in this case it'll be able to tell you the difference in both polarity and amplitude of the values that are coming into input ones and input two and it'll be able to do that for both uh, DC and AC and this is pretty hard to achieve because we want these components all to be exactly equal for a perfect balance and of course there's always going to be some variation in in components inside of a circuit and to show you how much the, or to give you an idea of how simplified this circuit is if we look at a 741 op amp which is an IC package that we'll be talking about in future videos if, if memory serves it has roughly 20 components in it and only a single capacitor so any signal that comes on one of its two inputs is going to be coupled whether it's DC or AC to its single output it doesn't have two outputs like this you'll notice that we also have two power supplies we have a, a positive uh, value VCC and a negative VEE and it's the value for VEE that's going to give us the current that's going to go through the through the circuitry. Uh, for right now we're not going to worry about any values we're just going to discuss this theoretically and and look at how the how the circuit would operate. So the voltage on RE to, to start out is going to be some value minus 0.7 of VEE so we have to turn both of these on it's going to take seven tenths of a volt from VEE to do so and we're going to then have VEE and 0.7 volts and taking the value of RE and dividing it into that will give us a emitter current now you ha if you look at this the emitter current that we're going to have has got to split between our two transistors and since it does that we know that whatever current is going through this has got to be split between these two and ideally we would like the current to be split exactly in half half the current going through this device and half the current going through this one and of course with betas being what they are the the values never do uh, come out exactly equal so I had to uh, cherry pick quite a few uh, 2N3904s before I got two that were reasonably close and I still had to add a, a resistor uh, to a potentiometer to, to balance out all the values. So making the assumption then that we have everything balanced, so our betas in, in uh, this transistor and this transistor are equal, our values for RC1 and RC2 are exactly equal, we know then that we have a, a total current of IRE and that IRE is going to be divided into by, by 2 and it's going to give us a current through our transistor here and we'll just call this transistor 1 so this will be 
the current through capacitor one on the emitter and this one or transistor one on the emitter and this will be the current through our transistor number two with zero volts on both of the inputs we should have everything identical going through both of these devices we should have the same voltage drop on RC1 and RC2 and that should give us outputs that are exactly the same well what happens if we now change the input on one side but leave the other side at zero or grounded so we're going to buy, apply some voltage to the base of this transistor. So we have some positive voltage on the base of this device. And this side, we'll keep it at grounded or at zero volts. Well, because we have a more positive value here, that's going to put more voltage on the base. And that's going to increase the potential difference between the base and the emitter and cause this transistor to conduct harder. So if we had a, a total of let's say 10 milliamps of current when both sides were grounded, input 1 and input 2 were grounded, we had 10 milliamps and it was split equally, so 5 milliamps here and 5 milliamps here. Everything's good. Uh, but now we can cause it one side to conduct a little bit harder and now of this 10 milliamps let's say that we now that we have 8 milliamps on this side and 2 milliamps on this side so the sums still have to equal the total current that's being allowed to pass by the value of RE the 8 milliamps is going to cause the voltage drop on RC1 so VRC1 that voltage drop is going to go up the voltage on VRC2 is going to go down. Well, if the voltage drop here goes up, the voltage at this output, so V out, must go down. And conversely, if the voltage drop here went down, we have more voltage that is going to be dropped on the collector of the device, so V out on this side goes up. The same thing would happen if I, I flip these two values around. So if I took my output now and applied it to input 2, so I put some positive voltage on the base here, grounded this side have my same 10 milliamps as as an example and because I'm driving this side harder let's again say I have 8 milliamps of the total 10 milliamps going through it here 2 milliamps on this side the voltage drop on VRC1 will decrease which makes the output signal here at V out 1 go up there's going to be a larger voltage drop on VRC2 so it goes up and then V output 2 must go down so you can see it's, it's a relatively straightforward and, and simple device well what happens if both sides uh, change uh, we apply a voltage on both sides and and they both change so we put a voltage on the base here of some value and then we apply another voltage on the base and let's make that a, a negative voltage on the base now it can't be any more negative obviously than the value of VE plus uh, 0.7 because then we're going to turn this transistor off entirely well the same conditions are going to apply we're going to drive this side less hard so there's going to be a lower current going through here we're driving this side harder because we have a positive voltage that, pos that forward biases this uh, a little bit more and the current again goes up on this side and down on this side and because we are applying a bigger difference a differential voltage this current might now go down to one milliamp and then this one might go up to nine milliamps just as an example 
and if we reverse this obviously the same thing is going to happen so what we really have in a differential amplifier is a constant current or a relatively constant current that's going to be established by some resistor and it's going to split between two transistors which each have their own inputs and ideally the split's going to be equal and we're going to drop that voltage across two resistors again perfectly equal and the balancing act should give us a differential or comparison between the inputs and the outputs and the comparison should be proportional uh, to a great degree of accuracy. We want that proportionality because we're trying to compare these two inputs. Another point we would like to take a look at is what occurs if we apply the same signal to to both sides. So let's say now that we have some kind of an AC signal that we are applying to both sides. So this signal now is common to both inputs, so input 1 and input 2. This is called a common mode signal. So what we're trying to find out is if we take this common signal, how much output do we have at, at 1 or 2? Because the inputs for both of these are in phase with each other, as this side goes positive, this side should also go positive. Both of these are going to have an increase in bias, which is exactly equal. So both going positive, both forward bias a little bit more. That's going to normally cause both of the currents to go up. But since the currents are fixed and the biasing changes are equal, the values at these points should remain absolutely constant. So if we were to put a capacitor on these outputs, and we're looking for this signal that we had coming in at these outputs, what we should see is zero under ideal conditions. There should be no output at all. The common mode signal, the signal common to both input 1 and input 2, is being canceled out because both sides of these circuits have exactly the same characteristics for amplification, uh, the betas are all the same, the resistors are the same, and the outputs should swing equally on both sides and because it's an equal swing with the with the the same current we should have zero at the output so this is common mode and we really want common mode to be extremely high and this is, is a case because imagine we have some kind of a, a signal that we're we're applying to this input and in this case let's say that it's just we're applying it to one input this one input is going to be applied here and it's going to cause this side to go up and down which is going to cause the voltage here to go up and down and of course at this output as well. But there's always going to be some common mode noise. For example, let's say that this was a, a 10 kilohertz signal and it, you know, if we're operating in, in the US we ha always have some kind of 60 hertz noise from from all of our electrical mains. If you're in Europe, you're going to have some kind of uh, a 50 hertz signal. Well, this 60 hertz or 50 hertz is going to be picked up under optimal conditions equally between these two points. So this is common noise to both of these inputs. This is the differential value that we're looking for. And we want this to be amplified at the outputs, its, its value to be, to be shown uh, accordingly. But we want this to essentially be suppressed. We're not interested in, in the noise that's common to both of these. So that's common mode rejection. And CMRR, and that's the common mode rejection ratio. And it's a, it can be given as a, as a simple ratio or, is it can, or it can also be given as in, in decibel. How does the circuit react to to AC signals that are are not equal or or may be out of phase. Let's simplify it again by using uh, waveforms in this case that are 180 degrees out of phase at, at input 1 and input 2. And again we have a constant value for IE and if we divide this value by 2 we would get the current through IE 
2 and IE 1. And because we're going to probably assume that collector current and emitter current are the same, those values are going to be the same as IC1 and, and IC2. And we're going to be using 2N3904s for our experiment. So this is going to hold true. Anything with a beta of 100 or greater, IE and IC are going to be just about equal or within 99 plus percent of, of one another. If we increase the drive on this side, so we're going to look at the first 180 degrees of each waveform. So we increase the drive on this side, we make it more positive, so the voltage on the base here goes up. The difference between base and emitter is going to increase, and that's going to cause the current that goes through this side of the circuit to increase. And again, if we use an imaginary 10 milliamps, we can say that it goes up to 8 milliamps on that side. If 8 milliamps is applied here, we're going to have 8 milliamps on the collector. So what we're going to see on VRC1 is an increase in the voltage that's dropped on this resistor. If we have an increase in voltage here, we must have a decrease here because the, the voltage drops are going to be just like a series circuit. Increase voltage drop on one component, the other component must go down. And we're going to see a decrease in the voltage on this side. So it's going to be a, a decreasing waveform. On our other side, we're going to have the, the 2 milliamps. Remember now we have a negative voltage on the base because we have the negative alternation coming in first. It decreases the drive between these two points. The current is going to then be dropped and a lower co current on IE2 is going to give us a lower current on IC2. With IC2 going down, the voltage drop on VRC2 must also be going down so the voltage at output 2 must be going up. It's they're going to act as a differential amplifier, but now we're going to amplify the difference in also in the potential between between these two points. And of course, when both of these inputs are the same frequency and amplitude, so we put a positive on one side and we put a positive on the other side, we now have a a common mode and the output should be should be zero. Well, this is the circuit that we'll be testing uh, shortly, and we need to do a little bit of analysis of it to see how it's actually going to react. And you'll notice that we have a RC, a value on the collector, a resistor on the collector for this second transistor, but we don't have one on this first transistor. Well, that's a big deal because it makes the configuration of this transistor circuit different than this, in that this side is a common collector and this side is a common base. So remember some of the characteristics that we had between a common collector and a common base. A common collector had no voltage gain. It actually had a voltage loss, a slight one, depending on what the design was, but AV, so nope, didn't exist. But the common base had a AV, and a pretty large one, because all the resistance that we were considering was whatever RE was, R prime E, plus whatever resistance at this point. And we'll talk about that shortly. In a common collector, we did have current gain. So in this part of the circuit, in this part of the differential amplifier, we're going to get our current gain uh, if, we were, if we were using it. But principally, we're also going to find that because uh, we are using a common collector, whatever voltage that we have at this point is going to be half of what our input voltage was. It's going to split equally between this part of the circuit and this part of the circuit. And, you know, we have the same 10k ohm resistors we here, so that's uh, something that we can pretty much ignore as far as uh, that, uh, that expectation. But we have 100 ohms here and 100 ohms here. And if everything is perfect at, at z with zero input, both of these currents on this at these points should be exactly the same. If these currents are exactly the same, that means that the RE value, our prime E values, the emitter uh, base junction resistance should be the same here and here. And if everything is equal from here to here and here to here, 
whatever voltage we have at the input is going to essentially be split in half by the time that it gets to our circuit over here. And our common base is going to take that vo whatever that voltage is that's left and it's going to give us a voltage gain here at the output. Additionally, neither one of these circuits exhibits a, a phase shift. So the first thing that we can look at is what kind of current can we expect to be going through RE1 and we're going to make the we're going to start out with both inputs or the, the input being grounded at, at this point and it already is on on this side so if we ground this we should have two equal currents well we have to know the current that's coming through here before we can determine what the current at this point is because we're going to have a forward bias junction and there's going to be a current going through the device, it's going to go through from emitter to base, but it's also going to go through our 100k ohm resistor. So we're going to get some voltage drop on this on, on RB1. And it's not going to be a very substantial one because the current is really small, but it's going to be present nevertheless. I've seen books put values as high as 1 volt to use and as low as uh, point. 8 volts. Okay, where did these come from? We know that a forward biased diode is going to drop roughly 0.7 volts. And because we have a little bit of a current going through RB1, we need to in include that voltage. So this voltage can be anywhere from 0.1 volt up to 0.3 volts. So this is a, an average. And I found that Use it with the 3904s at least, typically the voltage drop is about 0.15. So if I did that, I had to have 0.7 volts plus the 0.15 volts. So I'm looking at 0.85 volts. So what that 0.85 volts then, we, we look at that just like a, as a diode drop. Uh, we're including, of course, this resistance now. So with that included, we can now find what the voltage is going to be left here on this 10k ohm resistor. So what we should see then is uh, we're going to have 12 volts that's going to be applied, the negative 12, plus uh, because we're it's actually a drop so we have to add it to this device. We're going to have the 0.7 volts plus about 0.1 5 volts give or take and then we can divide that by the total resistance that the current has to go through the total resistance is going to be the 10k plus whatever the split value of this 200 ohms is so let's again assume that it's a perfect world and we have 100 ohms on the potentiometer on this side and 100 ohms on this side so we're going to end up with 10k plus 100 ohms and just doing the the math on that we will get the negative 12 plus 0.7 plus 0.15 and divide that by 10100 and we can expect a current of 1.5 one zero three milliamps okay so again assuming that everything is perfect this current then is going to be split between both of these transistors and dividing that by two and we should get 551 microamps roughly on on each side so 551 microamps here and 551 microamps at this point and because we have 551 microamps going through a 10k ohm resistor we can expect to see a 5.52 volt drop on RC and we won't see one over here we don't have a resistor in line what kind of amplification can we expect at the output of our, our differential amp? Well, the first thing we have to look at is, okay, we know that there is a common collector 
at this point. We know a common collector doesn't have any voltage gain. It does have a current gain and it has no phase shift and this goes back to the videos that we did uh, quite a while ago and hopefully you, uh, you've re reviewed those. On this side we have a common base. So the base is AC and DC grounded and our output is at this point and if you recall the way to get a gain for a common base was to use RC our output resistor. We don't have an RL uh, so we don't have to do anything in parallel with it. We have RC plus divided by R prime E2 the emitter junction resistance of the of the second transmitter transistor plus whatever resistance is is uh, on on the input uh, for the emitter. So RE. Now before I put the value for RE down Remember uh, that if we're dealing with a with an ideal circuit, we have 100 ohms of resistance on this potentiometer on this side, and then we'll have 100 ohms on this side as well. Uh, it splits uh, perfectly, so we'll just ignore this RE2 for right now. And also, we're going to make the assumption that since it's a perfect world and we're all very happy in it, <laughs> there's going to be 550 microamps. Of, of current on both of these branches. Okay, so RC, uh, we know that's going to be 10K. Uh, we don't know the value of R prime E2, and if you remember from the videos uh, we did earlier uh, to find R prime E, sometimes also called REJ, uh, that we take 25 millivolts, which is just the the thermal voltage at the at that junction. It's a given value divided by whatever the value of IE is. And since we know that uh, we have 550 microamps of current, we're going to have 45.45 ohms for our prime E. So 45.45 ohms for our prime E. And this is going to be true for our prime E 1 and Two, because it's the same current that's going through both of them, the resistance should be the same for both of them. Okay, so we know RC divided by R prime E2 plus RE. So we're going to call this one, uh, we'll make this RE3 and we'll call this one RE3 and this one we'll call it, uh, we'll make it RE2. So we're just replacing that and splitting it up into two equal values. Because this circuit actually sees uh, two R prime E values and RE values, we actually have to divide this lower part by two. Why does it see two of them? Well, you know that you have the 45 ohms here. And we also have 45 ohms here. And the gain is given by everything that's in the path in the circuit. Well, we have two 45s and we have two 100s. So this calculation would have to be redone it have to be multiplied by by 2 so the gain of our circuit then would be 10k divided by 2 times and re2 plus re3 is going to be 145.45 so the gain of our circuit can be so we have 10K divided by 2 times 145.45. And so we can expect 34.38. So our gain should be 34.38. Well, if our gain is 34.38, what's the actual output that we can expect? Because we have an input signal going through the circuit in, in this direction, let me try using a different color. So our input signal is going through the circuit, taking the path of least resistance. What we're going to find is that we have 45 and 100 ohms here, 
and then 45 and 100 ohms here. So whatever voltage we have at this point is going to be one half of whatever the input value was. And I believe I'm going to, I've decided on 500 millivolts for my input. And if I have to take half of that, I'm only going to have 250 millivolts that's going to be applied to this point. Well, if it's only 250 millivolts to get V out, that equals V in times whatever the value is for AV. And we're going to be looking at 250 millivolts times 34.38. So Uh, roughly 8.5, 8.6 volts. So 8.6 volts for our output. And we'll go ahead and test that on the circuit as well. So we now have the voltage gain. Uh, we've you, we've re reviewed how to get the R prime E value. And the only thing that we really haven't talked about so far is what's the input resistance going to be for the whatever our signal sees at, at this stage. Well, our signal is going to be, as, as you remember, we have, to, we have to include beta for the resistance. The, resist, the, the current at this point is, is quite small. So let me clean up the... the work surface a little bit. The current at, at this stage is quite small, and the current here is quite large. Well, how many times larger is it here? It's beta times bigger. Well, if the current is beta times bigger at this point, the resistance must be beta times bigger at, at this point. What's the resistance then, and what's beta? Again, we would have no idea, no idea what the beta of this circuit is going to be. Uh, 2N3904 can be anywhere from 100 to... 300. So we could pick the middle road or uh, we can be on the safe side again and just say all right worst case scenario we're going to assume a transistor with a beta of 100 and we'll go ahead and use that in our in our determination. Okay so we know that it's a beta of 100 and we know that that's going to multiply whatever resistance is on on the output side uh, to get us what's the resistance at the input to the base. So what are those resistances that are that are over here? We know that we have to go through R prime E1. We know we have to go through the, the this uh, 100 ohms, but because this side is also forward biased, it's part of part of the resistance path. We have a forward bias at this point. So we're going to have the R prime E for this transistor as well. So we have R prime E1 plus R prime E2. And if we split these resistors up, we again have 100 ohms on each side. But in this case, we just can, it can include R E2. So that gives us all of the resistance that's on the output side. Well, we have to get it on the input side. And to do that, we just multiply that resistance times beta. So now we have the resistance at that point. Well, we also have a 100 K ohm resistor RB1 at this point and it's in parallel with the base resistance. So we have a parallel equation which we must include RB1. So what does this give us? Again, let's put it into our, our calculator. And we're just going to say 45.45 ohms. That's, I'll clear it out first. 45.45 ohms times 2, because we have RE1 and RE2. Plus, we have a RE2 value of 200 ohms. So there's our total resistance at this point. Times our beta of 100. We're using the worst case scenario. So we're expecting to have roughly 29 uh, K of resistance on the base of the 
of the transistor but that's in parallel with that 100 ohms so 2990 and I'm going to use the the reciprocal uh, method so x over 1 of the answer plus 100k x over 1 equals that take the reciprocal of that so we can expect to see about at, at worst 22.53 k ohms of resistance at at that point so there's our input resistance so now we've gotten our voltage gain and we're expecting about 8.6 volts out and we also have our our input resistance at at this point well, here's the circuit that we're going to be testing shortly and this is a RB1 so this is our 100 K ohm resistor on the base our capacitor to which is going to couple the input to the base of the transistor which is going to be Q1 here's RE2 so that's our potentiometer RE1 so that's going to be the main current determining device for DC through the circuit and then RE2 continues over our common base we have a that 100 K ohm resistor and this time we're we have the second stage completely grounded for both AC and DC and then here's our output and here is RC so VCC is attached at this point and this point the negative is at this point so you can see that's attached to RE1 so if we start to fire the circuit up the first thing that we want to look at is what kind of current do we have going into the circuit to give us a total and then we want to measure the currents that are going through each side and see if they're balanced and if they're not we're going to adjust uh, RE2 to get a to get a good balance and once we have the balance for that then we have we know we're DC we're identically uh, we're, we're identical on both sides of the circuit uh, we're going to put in an AC signal now unfortunately AC signals have a tendency to change the the beta of of the of the transistors and we need to find a way to overcome that and again that's a kind of a going back to what I just said about using a constant current source there's a transistor configuration that we're going to use and that's going to improve the uh, current uh, steadiness of the circuit and also improve the the overall uh, constant mode or common mode rejection ratio so let's get started by measuring some currents and see what we come up with on uh, our circuit I've got all of the connections to my circuit I'm using my 1272A to monitor the the left part of the differential amp and the 1271 is monitoring the the right side on the lower section I've hooked up my 34461 to measure the total current to show you that the sum of the currents in each one of the branches has got to be equal to this mainline branch which and uh, that current was established by by this resistor so if we take a look at all of the meters at one time you can see that I have 500 and five microamps on the left 594 on the right it's not balanced but the sum of these two should come out to be the total current and uh, for accuracy of course this is going to be the, the definitive one uh, on my bench so we're uh, actually a little bit off on these but roughly we should have point five five milliamps or 550 microamps on both channels or both sections and the potentiometer has been placed in there to make the adjustment so if I begin adjusting the circuitry to achieve a balance and it's going to be a little bit difficult because the potentiometer is relatively coarse for the fine adjustments I'm going to have to make or would like to make to balance out the values that's as close as I'm going to be able to get but you can see that both of the sections are are, are balanced and that our differential amplifier has got current 
and now we are ready to test it with an oscope and apply a 500 millivolt peak to peak 1k hertz signal to test the amplification. Here's the output of the differential amplifier. My yellow trace is the input, my 500 millivolts peak to peak, and the output, which I'm, is on the blue trace and is shown here, is 8.24. So I'm about 5% uh, lower than I would have expected, but uh, still well within, well within the tolerance. So the, so the differential gain is very good. So now let's go ahead and see what we have for common mode gain. We now know the differential gain of the circuit is going to be about 34. So that's our voltage gain uh, differential. Uh, we now need to know what the common mode gain is. So what we have to do here is apply this input signal to both sides of, of the circuit. So we'll take uh, our 1K ohm resistor and attach it to ground. We'll keep it the same way. Uh, break the circuit at this point and now attach our input to C2 into the base of this second transistor. With that being the case, we know, that, and everything is, uh, again, a perfect world, both sides of these uh, of the circuit are exactly the same. So from this point to this point, it's the same. From this point to this point, everything is exactly the same. So we would expect uh, to have very small output. Unfortunately, we have a value for RE1 that we have to contend with. And what this is going to do to our equation, under normal conditions, we would have the voltage gain of, of, of the circuit at this point. It's going to be RC divided by whatever the resistance is on this point. Well, these are all going to be a wash. So this resistor here and these two resistors here. But since we have 10K ohm here from this point to this point and 10K ohms from here to here, uh, under normal conditions, we would just divide it by RE1, but because we're actually m doubling the resistance that we have, it's, it's uh, showing up on this side and it's showing up on this side, we end up with RC is going to be two times the value of RE1. So for our purposes, we're looking at 10K divided by two times 10K, or 0.5 for our AV for common mode. And again, using our 200 or our 500 millivolts uh, for our input signal, getting ahead of myself, times uh, our AV of 0.5, we have 250 millivolts then for our our output or V out. So the common mode then is the ratio of the differential voltage divided by our common mode voltage. And our common mode voltage is 250 millivolts. And our differential voltage is going to be 8.6, approximately. So we're looking at a, a, roughly uh, 34. So double check this. 8.6 divided by 0.25 and we get 34.4. So this is just the ratio. If we wanted to do this in, in dB, we would take our ratio, just as we have done before, so we would take the A, uh, V, the differential voltage, divided by the common mode voltage, take the logarithm of that result, and then multiply it by 20. So for this circuit, we have 34.4, and then take the logarithm of the answer. So do that again, logarithm of 34.4 times 20. And so we're dealing with uh, 30.73 dB of common mode rejection. And I can tell you that's a pretty, pretty poor result because a good op amp will have a common mode rejection in, in at least 70 or 80 decibels. Now the way we can get closer to this value is by actually replacing this uh, 
section of the circuit with a constant current source. And we'll take a look at that shortly. Yeah, here's my, still have my 500 millivolt peak to peak input. And I have jumpered the the base of the first transistor to the base of the second transistor. Here's my input. It's going to be the yellow trace and the blue trace will be the output. And here's my waveform and you can see that on the input there's my 500 uh, millivolts peak to peak and my output peak to peak on the blue trace is 200 200 and 280 millivolts peak to peak so it's roughly the the 0.5 that we were expecting so because of the, if we take that 0.5 uh, millivolts of 500 millivolts times 0.5 we should get 0.25 and we have about 280 millivolts so so all in all it's a uh, it's very close to what we expected. Now let's take a look at what we can do with a constant current source in the same kind of circuit. This is the same circuit as we had before, but I have replaced the resistor with a constant current source. I've just used a, a transistor, uh, used voltage divider biasing to get a voltage on the base, which you'll remember from prior videos, at least I hope you do, um, that we just take the resistor of interest and divide it by the total resistance that we had, uh, RB of the first and plus RB of the second, and times VCC, or in this case, VEE. So since these resistors are exactly the same, we know that we're going to have 6 volts on the base of the transistor, and it's going to be negative. This negative uh, 6 volts is still more positive than the 12 volts that we're applying. So the, cert so the transistor is forward biased. And then we're going to have 5.3 volts negative. That's going to be dropped on RE. I tried to keep the currents uh, going through these circuits identical. And remember we had uh, approximately... 1.1 uh, uh, milliamps of current in, in the previous circuit. So with 5.3 volts applied divided by 1.1 milliamps uh, we should have a res resistance of 400 and, well 4.81 K uh, 2 K. Well there's no such animal as a 4.818 K ohm resistor unless you special order it so we used, I used the closest value that there is, and of course that's going to be a 4.7K. So the current that we should expect through here is 5.3 divided by 4.7K. So we should look at about 1.127 or 1.13 milliamps. And again, uh, for in the in the area we're good. Uh, this isn't a precision resistor. None of these are either. So again, plus or minus 10% for, for all things. And we'll go ahead and check that out. Now what you should see with a, a setup like this is this improves common mode rejection because this resistance here goes way, way, way up. We ha now have this collector which essentially, uh, it, it's, it's so large, the, this uh, resistance is so large, that when we take RC, which is uh, our 10K, and we, we take the value of, that we would have down here, and let's say that it's 100K, we're going to sh we should end up with a gain of, of, of 0.1, and that's because that, of that really large collector uh, resistance value. So let's go ahead and, and, and check the common mode uh, of the device. It's still going to work the same uh, for a differential amplifier. So we would still expect the same 34.34, I think it was, at the output here. Uh, so 500 millivolts in, and we should get uh, roughly the, the 8.6 that we'd hoped, but we actually measured 8.2. So with this, we should get a much less lower value for the common mode, and that's going to make our CMRR uh, much better. 
and we'll go ahead and look at that right now. I now have everything hooked up to test my constant current sources capability of improving common mode rejection. Here's my, my constant current transistor and the biasing circuitry. And you can see I have 1.117 milliamps and we calculated 1.13 milliamps so we're really in good shape there. And I am going I've got the same 500 millivolt input on the first stage and I've jumpered it also over to the second stage through identical capacitors. And I'm taking my output at the at the collector and I've changed my scope probe to times one so I can get a little bit better sensitivity for the voltage but unfortunately using times one also adds a lot of noise to the circuit from the actual oscilloscope so it's kind of a trade-off but you'll be able to see that we have a considerable improvement in the common mode rejection and the, on the scope what you'll see is this. Here's our original signal, uh, our input, and both channels are on 100 millivolts per division, so I have my 500 millivolt input in the yellow trace. The blue trace is my output, the common mode, and you can see that it's almost non-existent. And I'll increase the sensitivity, and you can see that I've got quite a bit of noise in, in the signal. And if I were trying to guess what the what the amount of noise or what the what the actual signal is at one millivolt per division it would appear to be about uh, one two perhaps three millivolts and that really is a guesstimate so plugging that three millivolts into our common mode rejection ratio calculation and in this case we had and we'll use the the measured value so we know we had 8.2 volts for the differential voltage and we're going to say that this is three millivolts and that gives us a common mode rejection ratio of 2733 which is a great improvement over what we had and if we want to find out what that is in decibels we just take uh, the logarithm of the answer and multiply it by 20 and now we have almost 69 dB of common mode rejection so the circuit has improved substantially so all of this is really a precursor to the introduction of operational amplifiers which we are going to start in the next video and as always if you have uh, comments hopefully good ones so you know leave us a thumbs up if you liked it uh, and if you want to see something else or you have some suggestions for improvements I'm always open to to those and once again thanks for watching and see you next time